Alejandro. I go on by Triplet Twitter and I work at 47 Degrees, which is a consulting and training company focused on the functional programming space. Today, I would like to talk to you about two Haskell libraries, Servant and Mu. And we are gonna not only talk about those, but also compare them and see what they do the same and what do they differ. So just to give some context, what are Servant and Mu? These are two sets of libraries to develop services in Haskell. Servant focuses more on the web services space, so REST, OpenAPI, and it allows you to generate both client and server using these technologies. Mu is actually part of a broader ecosystem, which includes a Scala library and also a Kotlin one in development, and focuses more on protocols usually used in internal microservices like gRPC and also right now on GraphQL. So as you can see, they focus on a very similar tech space. If you are developing a service or a microservices in your company and you don't know yet which protocol you wanna use, for example, these are two natural options. But here, more importantly, we're gonna compare them because they both use a lot of type level techniques available in newer versions of Haskell. So they use every possible GXC extension and some more. So I find this an interesting exploration of this design space. What do we do when we have strong types? And some question like how much of this use is actually exposed to the user? How much the programmer needs to know about these strong types in order to use Servant or Mu. So let's begin, but before, a disclaimer. I'm one of the core developers of Mu. I've used Servant but never contributed to it. So it might be that sometimes I go deeper or I am biased towards Mu because that's just what I know best. So Servant. Servant was very innovative when it came because it has this idea of being able to represent your whole REST API using a type. And uh, right now that we are grown used to it, it might sound like natural, but I would say that when it came through, I, I, I at least found this to be a very interesting and different approach to what was out there. So let's look below. So imagine you want to define an API with two roots. So users and then user with an user ID and then both you the HTTP verb get. What you would write as your definition of your API is what you see above. You just use these combinators like colon greater than, get and capture to define parts of your URL and what is the method to return thing, what is the verb that you use and so on. So this type is what it used throughout all these libraries to talk about, well, your roots. The first thing you can do is to create a server for, to do this. So in order to do so, what you need to write is a function for each of the different roots that you have. So I think this is, this is well, as simple as it can get in Haskell. Furthermore, the library takes care of translating, for example, this capture user ID int, which says that there is part of the URL, which should be a number and which we will call user ID as an argument to the function. So if you look at the very bottom line, you see a user function taking an in. So the library takes care of all this marshalling. The only difference from uh, a normal function is that they all run in this handler monad and handler is something quite simple. It's just IO plus the ability to stop. Actually, it's defined as except T of server error, which allows you to call throw error to stop the computation and then just IO. We'll explore this kind of uh, simple choice later on. As I mentioned and hinted before, serialization is handled by the library, but not only turning, for example, a string into an int when you have part of the URL capture, also, if you have something like an user being returned, the fact that it has to be translated into JSON is handled using uh, the usual ASON to JSON 
type was. But all of this is sort of uh, linked together. So every uh, so when you write the domain logic, you don't have to really care about all these serialization details. Apart from serving the API, what you can do is take this definition and generate a client out of it. So you just call this client thing and you pass a proxy to specify what is the, the type you want. And then at compile time, those things are generated into actual clients, one for each root in your, in your service. Now let's look at the other side, me. Mew works quite differently in the way you specify what are the possible routes, possible messages that your, your service can take. Instead of writing them directly in Haskell, what you write is a schema definition of one of the supported protocols. For example, if we use gRPC, this is what I'm doing here, you write a definition of your service using protocols buffer syntax and they look a bit like Java in which you don't have an implementation. So here we are defining two messages, hello request and hello reply, and a service greeter which has two methods. One is say hello, takes a hello request, returns a hello reply with a message. And then we will have also say many hellos, which takes and returns a stream of those things. I just wanted to, to show you the streams uh, because for example, that's one of the reasons why you may want to use gRPC instead of uh, REST because you have this kind of uh, streaming possibilities, even bidirectional streaming as, as I'm doing here with say main hellos. So you write this file and this file is written as I said, outside of any other part of your Haskell project. And then using template Haskell, we import this service definition. So you write this line in which you say, I want to import this gRPC and this will uh, generate two types, one called schema, which has this message, this information about the messages, and then one called service, which has the service definition and I want to import it from this file hello world.proto or whatever it's found in your project. So messages, these hello request messages and hello reply messages can be mapped to Haskell type. This is something that you don't have to do, but if you want to just work with uh, Haskell types, what you do is you define these types. Uh, you have to do this by hand at this moment. And then you write this deriving to a schema and from a schema, which allow you to serialize and deserialize from this uh, schema thing. Uh, so you see that here we are taking a different approach from what Servant is doing. Here you have one single uh, kind of to and from schema. And we will look at this different serialization later. And then the way you define the server is quite similar. You define one function for each uh, for each method in your service. Here we have say hello and say many hellos. And if you can say hello, the mapping is quite similar to what Servant did. Just uh, inputs become arguments, output become outputs. And there is this server error IO monad to wrap everything, which is actually defined exactly as the handler monad in Servant as except the server error of IO. Uh, just to give you the whole picture, if you want to use uh, streaming, what you use is a conduit. So here we have a conduit as input and a conduit where you want to put uh, all your output, a sync, and then you connect them into your definition of say many hellos. Another difference, and I will uh, talk about this more later, is that when you define a service, you have to, again, say what is the relation between each function and the name in the original protocol buffers file. And this is something that you didn't have to do in, in Servant. So we will look at why you have to do it in one place and not in the other, and what are the trade-offs here. And the nice thing, as I said about Mio, is that once you define one server, you can expose this using many protocols. So the same kind of service definition can be exposed to different interfaces if the uh, protocol is compatible with all the things you need. For example, uh, if you want to expose using GraphQL, maybe you cannot use 
uh, one kind of streaming because it only supports output streams. Or if you wanna uh, use Avro as your serialization uh, layer instead of protocol buffers, well, there are some things which cannot be done in Avro. So, so, but if everything is supported like here, you can actually just run concurrently your same server, your same service, exposing this in three different protocols in three different ports and things will just work. Great, so now that we have sort of set the stage, let's the battle begin. Let's focus on three different things uh, which are important when you are working with this library. So how you define what are the rules or methods on your service, how you serialize and deserialize information and how you represent your API as a type. So let's go one, uh, one by one, looking at what things are similar and where things differ. Our first focus is gonna be how we define the server, how we define the handler, what, how we define the functionality which your uh, server exposes. I've already glimpsed at it, but both servant and emu use this idea of having very simple functions in which arguments represent the input. So if the user route had a user ID, which is an integer, the handler just has one argument, which is an integer, simple, as simple as it can get. And they both execute in a similar monad, which look mostly like except the of some kind of everything of IO. The servant docs actually give you a very good notion of why use this handler thing and not a more complicated idea. Point is that you want to use the simplest monad that, well, first of all, allows us to return successfully or fail because there are cases in which you want to return like a 404 or an internal error or, you know, this is an idea I cannot found. And to do this, we need some kind of throw error. In this case, this is given by the accept the observer error. But being very practical, in all of these services, most of you want to do is to go and query a database. That's what most of these services do. So we really need IO there to do so. And Serpent developers, and this is something that in Mu we've taken uh, from them, they decided let's go with the simplest monad that we can use. And I think it's a very fair assumption. I've never seen places where you really want to go much, much uh, farther. And I found this to be a very good trade-off. Uh, well, I can do any IO, but that's what I want to do anyway. In both cases, there is a way to escape out of this single monad. And this is done using a natural transformation, which is just a fancy name to say a function, which is parametric on my X. So you have like F of X to G of X. So if you, in both cases, you have like a uh, server, you have hoist server. And in, in Mu, this is given by different, uh, different functions which have trans at the end, but you see that they look quite similar. They both have some information about the API or protocol you want to use. And then they have this for all function, which essentially tells me, okay, everything I know is how to run things in server error IO or handler IO. But if you give me a way to turn whatever you're giving me, this M that you want to talk about into what I need, I'm super happy to do so. So that's the way in which you can escape out of the monad. Uh, this is, for example, interesting if you want to run with uh, some kind of resource T or logger T to introduce logging or, or resource handling. Well, you can just give uh, the, the function which runs this monad, like the run resource T or the uh, run STDR logger or something like this. Uh, and this will be accurate in both cases. Now, there is a difference in how you define these handlers, though. Handlers in Servant must appear in the same order as they are defined. If you remember when we defined the server for the user API, we had to write users and uh, fancy or user. And these have to map exactly the same order that we had in the user API. Users is gonna be the, the function which defined the first route and user is gonna be the one defining the second route. So you really have to keep the type 
and the definition of the server or the client in sync. In Mu, on the other hand, uh, there are special functions uh, which allow you to, uh, well, which essentially reorder the things uh, that are given an argument by mapping each method with the corresponding implementation. And this is done all at the type level using type level strings. So this add, say hello between quotes, actually a type level string in which you say this is the implementation of the method say hello, and this is implementation of the method say many hellos. Uh, although internally this is translated to the servant stuff. And why this is so is because figuring out what thing you want to run in servant style, it's much simpler at runtime than doing it every time you need to do so in this, uh, in this thing. You will have to look at the uh, thing every time. So that way we can get a nicer uh, user API because you don't have to keep this in order, but the matching, the matching to the actual uh, more uh, the usual fasted representation is done only once at compiling. So let's let's compare this thing. We've said that in uh, in Servant you have to keep the same order as what you declare, which has a very interesting trade-off that compile time is decreased, but I don't like it very much because. Uh, if you change something in API, you will have an error uh, in which they say that two types do not match. And I think this is a bit hard to read. In the case of Mu, we use uh, out of order, but we tag with names. And I think this, this improves readability, even though there is this small trade-off in which you have to duplicate the names in both the schema and the code. Uh, actually, if you forget uh, one of the of the of the methods, you will have a nice message saying this method is missing. But if you misuse the combinators like method and single survey that I was showing before, you will also get a terrible error. So it seems that both libraries have this problem that if you make uh, a mistake in how you put servers together, uh, this might be hard to track if you are not used to do so. Our second focus is serialization. From a user perspective, in Servant, there is a reuse of different classes per content type. So for example, when you have to serialize or deserialize something as a string, which could be when it comes in the URL, for example, there is a specific from and to HTTP APA data for this thing. And if you want to use JSON, you just use the usual from and to JSON coming from JSON, from the de facto standard JSON library in Haskell. In the back in the library, there is actually one single uh, one single type class called uh, Mimo Render, in which they use uh, these type level names like JSON. That's what we saw on the root, and then they define how each of the, these context types is rendered. So what you would see is that there is an instance saying that if you want to render something as JSON, that's what the last line is saying, what you would have to give is a to JSON from the ancient library. So that's how they link both things together. So user perspective, there are different uh, there are different type classes for each different content type. And as far as possible, they reuse the ones which are already available in the ecosystem. Uh, in the implementation, there is actually one type class which links each content type with the actual thing they need. Mu does this in a completely different way. There is an intermediate term data type to which you map your Haskell type. So you, your Haskell type is mapped to this term and this term is something given by Mu itself. And then there is automatically, wait, well not automatically, has, somebody has written it, uh, a way to translate from this term into whatever thing you need. So abro or protocol buffers or JSON. So actually from, from the user perspective, what you do is you write your schema type and then you just need to define once that you wanna to and from schema. And this does the conversion to term. 
and this is automatized using DHC generics in the same way that the, for example, to JSON or from JSON can be also automatized using DHC generics. However, that means that Mu schema, which is uh, the, the library in Mu, which define all these term business is yet another generics library. And for what I mean, a, something which define a uniform representation across many different protocols. And this is why we can then represent, we can then translate these things to either our protocol buffers or whatever we need. And of course, this is said by the guy who has already written, well, co-written uh, other two, actually one more on the open uh, generics library. So yeah, it's not, a weird thing that my brain, which seems to be wired to write generic programs, uh, just came up with another way to use generics in a completely different uh, place. So let's compare this thing now. In Servant, uh, what you do is you need to manually derive its content type, whereas in Mu, only a single from and to schema is required. So what is the trade-off here? Well, I think uh, the main thing is, uh, does one size fit all? So what is the problem with the Mu approach? Uh, the nice thing, of course, is that uh, <clears throat> there is no user code to move to another protocol. So you write one and somebody writes now how to uh, go from this term to uh, my fancy protocol version two, and then you just get it for free. Whereas in Servant, you would need to have at least one new instance, one new line in the deriving thing. However, the bad thing is that there is a lack of configurability. If you define manually your to JSON or from JSON instance, uh, you can say that, well, this key has to have another name or maybe uh, this is an integer, but I want to represent this as a string or whatever. This configurability is not available in in, in Mu. And we could, of course, talk about how we can do this, maybe using the Riving via or some other fancy thing, but this just gets harder and harder. The other bad thing is that this term data type is sort of a Frankenstein monster. So uh, some protocols may support union, some not, and the term data type is sort of a thing which needs to support a bit of everything, but not everything good enough. Um, so this is what I think is a trade-off. Uh, I think that this shows something uh, interesting though, is that Haskell is uh, good enough to just think to do this kind of one size fit all, which I think would be not so simple in other languages. And in Haskell, we have a generics and we have uh, all the step level machinery, which allow you to say and to explore this part of the design space. Something which I also want to uh, mention about Servant is that because Servant focuses more on kind of HTTP services, it has top-notch integration to produce HTML, which is a common output if you are defining something on HTTP. So uh, you have uh, packages like Servant Lucid and Servant Blaze, and this Lucid and Blaze are, are two of the main libraries in the Haskell ecosystem to produce HTML. Mio, on the other hand, only focuses on data returning services. So if you want to use it to define something more akin to a front-end service, this is not really your choice. Now, third focus, AP representation. And for this, I mean how each library uh, takes this definition of what your service and method is and represent this within the type system. I mentioned this before, in Servant, the type is an API and the programmer writes this type manually. So what you would do if you start developing a web service using Servant is you would go and write this type or you need to add a root or something. This is the first stop in your journey. And then from this, you define the server or the client or whatever you need. The nice thing about this is that this is, I think it's very easy to understand uh, and also the fact that this is very domain specific, this is specifically for web services, uh, makes the sort of the, the interface between like the, the thinking and the coding phase very easy. So if I read, if I know a bit of Haskell, I think you can easily read uh, what is going on here. However, the fact that this is 
written in Haskell makes it difficult to share. And because of that, you see packages like Servant.js or Servant Elm, which create clients in JavaScript or Elm. But I think this is a bit of a, of a, of a uh, not so great thing because if your type changes, then that means you have to run some code which then generates the JavaScript or Elm code, which are, as you know, it's, it's too far from changing my type to actually get in a client which is not using Haskell. In, uh, in Mu, on the other hand, we do a schema first approach. We first write the schema, this is this hello world proto, and then we import this thing using template Haskell. And actually this results in a, this complicated schema definition. So uh, this returns this type, which says has a record with a fields and a text, and it has some annotations because if you wanna use uh, protocol buffers, you need to know uh, some IDs to be able to do the mapping. And not only that, it also generates some service definition, which you can see it's very big. So it's a service greeted with a method, say hello, with a single argument, because arguments couldn't be single or a streaming or whatever, uh, and returns a single value also from the schema and so on. So this is way more complex than servant. This definition of the whole schema and service is actually quite big and some you don't really wanna write by hand. So what I find about this schema first approach is that it's actually better for sharing across team. So there are very well established gRPC and GraphQL clients in uh, Scala, in Java, in Swift, whatever. And you can just give them this uh, kind of proto file and use them as a gathering point be be uh, between maybe your backend, which is using Mu, and your frontend, which might be using some other technology. Also something nice for us as developers is that because everything is done in template Haskell, this kind of a schema service definition is not so much exposed. So I explain it to you to show that it's very big, but we've been able to change this, to change the representation whenever we had to support something new in every major release without changes to the example. So you just uh, keep the import and then, well, the way it's important is different, but you don't really care because the fact that it's in sync to whatever uh, new library version you're using is what you want. However, and again, this is where things usually go bad. If you want to know what has gone wrong, maybe you, there is a glitch on the, on the template Haskell, or you are doing something which is wrong, you suddenly get this humongous types because we are no longer talking about one line saying users get JSON list of user. We are suddenly having a uh, method with a type level string with a list of things and arc single and red single. So this makes much harder to uh, read when you have an error. And and I've, I've grown used to sort of uh, ignoring part of the errors, but they are there. They are still taking 10 lines of my screen space. And especially if you're a beginner, it's very hard to know where to focus. On. So uh, that's kind of the main disadvantage I see here. So what's the comparison? Uh, in Servant, the main focus is HTTP oriented protocols. In Mu, uh, this is multi-protocol, so the same code can work for different protocols. Uh, and again, apart from the trade of the error reporting, we have this problem in Mu about does one size fit all? On the one hand, it's great that we could write this library in which users can move from protocol to protocol without having to change align apart from adding this run with this protocol. However, uh, RPC protocols are really different from each other, uh, way more than serialization formats. Serialization is mostly something is not supported here, or here you have load 16, 32, and 64, and here you only have uh, float 64. And that's sort of easy to understand. But RPC protocols seem to, uh, seem to be different in, in more subtle ways. And that means that when things go wrong or when you suddenly take something that was working in gRPC and you ask uh, Mu, please run it using GraphQL, uh, it's hard to diagnose when this is not possible because this might be because the protocol does not support a specific kind of a string, for example. The nice thing is that, uh, you know, people have also worked about breaching these both worlds. So this, of course, answers the question, okay, 
What if I want to expose my new thing using HTTP? Because I've been talking about gRPC and GraphQL, but you know, REST, OpenAPI are also sensible protocols. So, uh, contributor to the library made the huge effort of writing this bridge in which you can just expose a new server as a servant one. However, you might see that there is uh, some missing information because, well, a new server uh, doesn't know about any notion of roots. So how should my things be on the URL? The nice thing is we, because of this in part, uh, we build an annotation machinery in which you write a type family instance in which you say, well, I want to annotate this service with some servant roots. That's essentially what these arguments tell me. And uh, these annotations look like this. So this is all also very strongly typed. So the fact that you use servant root here means that you can only use some specific annotations there. And you say, well, uh, the top level root is going to be greed. And then in the method say hello, what you are going to have is a root say slash hello. And we are using pause in this case. Uh, and doing this thing, there is a, a type family which translates uh, from the new complicated type using these annotations, producing a servant API type. And from this, uh, we can start working because remember in servant, the API is the first thing you define, the API type. And then we can just go and translate each of the, uh, each of the instances of, of how a new server looks like. Uh, right now, it only supports one argument and this has to be in the body. And this again points to the fact that if you try to do too many things, then there is a lack of configurability being done there. So that's uh, all I wanted to say about new server and server. As, as I said, uh, you can help us bring in both worlds uh, because we didn't have the, the time to do many of these things. For example, you cannot have an open API definition being imported into more to support more complex servant routes. So it's been a pleasure to talk about this thing. I mean, Mu is something I've devoted uh, many time uh, and, and I've taken a lot of inspiration of servant, which I think is a great library and, and really set up the stage of how uh, a strong types can move from all these, you know, vector and not having the head and, and this kind of uh, toy examples into something very useful like a web service. So all I can say is enjoy the, enjoy the rest of the conference and I'll be happy to hear any suggestions, questions on anything you want to uh, talk about, about Mew and Servant. Thanks for watching.